the tale of two Stuart S50 steam engines. Part 4. This episode is an experiment and owes very little to engineering practices. Can I fit bearing inserts that I turned in my lathe into the main casting after enlarging the existing holes using my drilling machine and three different sized twist drills? Then finishing off with a simple hand reamer. The question is, why would I want to do this? Well, the bed casting in its entirety from Stuart Models is £39 plus VAT plus delivery. By the way, on screen at the moment, I'm still removing the burrs on the crankshaft from the grub screw marks. And now the crankshaft is a really smooth fit through the flywheel, so that's going to be okay. If I don't remove the burrs on the crankshaft entirely, when I insert the crankshaft into the new bearings, they're going to be scored. Hopefully, to avoid any experts writing in, here is an explanation of my logic. The method that I'm about to show for enlarging the existing warm bearings in the main casting is not recommended, and I only did it this way out of curiosity to see how the job worked out. The worn bearing holes were drilled oversize using my drilling machine, and the enlarged holes were reamed by hand on the workbench. There are much better and more accurate ways to do this job, that is, assuming that you have the necessary equipment in your workshop. On with the job. Here I'm looking at different drill sizes because I can't decide how big to make the holes to take bushes of a substantial size. The crankshaft is 9 32nds of an inch in diameter and this twist drill is 5 16ths of an inch and it's too small. I think the main reason that these bearings are so badly worn is because of the mass of the flywheel. It's a very heavy flywheel that I've never seen fitted to an S50 before. I'm going to make the bush at the flywheel end more substantial than at the other end. That should support the extra weight and wear much better. This is a 3 8 of an inch twist drill and I think it's the one that I'm going to end up using. I'm a bit concerned that the existing holes in this part of the casting are not in the centre. This is not a massive issue but it's not going to look too good when the hole is enlarged. In this clip I'm checking the size of the reamer, this one is 3 8 of an inch. When reaming I would normally use one imperial drill size less than 3 8 but for this job I'm going to use two smaller twist drill bits because I have a feeling that they're not going to line up properly and I may need to file them to the right dimension. I'm going to drill the holes first of all using the twist drill on the left. By doing it this way it gives me an escape route. If I drill the holes with this one first and they don't line up properly, I can make some adjustments using a file, then re-drill with the larger size drill. There are so many different ways I could have done this job, but in the end, for the tutorial, here I am at my drilling machine and I haven't even clamped the part in the vise. It's resting on a piece of mahogany. There are many ways to do this job. I could bolt it to a Keats angle plate and then use a milling machine to go through or I could pack the engine up to centre height and mount it on the cross slide of my Myford lathe and bore the hole that way. But no, I'm doing it the way a village idiot would do it. Not that I have anything against village idiots. I have to remember that I live in a village, and this is a fairly idiotic way of doing the job, but don't forget, if I get it wrong, all I have to do is buy a brand new sole plate casting from Stuart Models. £39 plus VAT, value added tax, plus delivery. I bought some Stuart S50 castings quite a few years ago and I built one of these engines in a day and I set myself a personal challenge not to use a four-jaw chuck. I bored the cylinder in a three-jaw chuck, not recommended. However, I built it in a day and it worked perfectly. This is the second twist drill that's gone through. This side of the casting plumber blocks needed to be filed flat, ready for my modified bearing bush that I'm going to fit at this point. At this stage I thought I'd better bite the bullet and remove the cylinder. The small bolts were very tight but none of them sheared off. At this stage, using a 3 8 of an inch diameter hand reamer, I reamed the hole through the bearings. I rotated the reamer very slowly using a large tap wrench that I have. Now it's nearly time to go over to the lathe and make the bearings. I'm doing three things in this clip. I'm confirming the dimensions of the crankshaft, 
I'm looking at this reamer and wondering if it's the same size, and I'm also looking at a piece of leaded bronze. Initially, I was going to use this piece of leaded bronze for making the bearing bushes, and here's the piece that you've just seen in the three-jaw chuck of the Boxford lathe, and I'm facing across the front. At this stage, I thought it would be a good idea to show viewers the difference between phosphor bronze and brass. In my hand at the moment is a piece of brass. This is absolutely useless for a bearing material. When I was young and foolish, I once made some bearing bushes using a piece of brass, and they only lasted about an hour and a half before they wore out. Now that I'm old and not quite as foolish, I do think about things with a little bit more depth and perception. Cast iron is an excellent bearing material, and it just so happens that I had these two castings. I don't know where they came from. But from a size point of view, they're going to be ideal for the job. This is into the procedure. I'd already had the part in the chuck the other way round and turned the larger diameter, which is now very suitable for being held in the chuck. And now, as you can see, I've turned the part around in the chuck to machine this part of the cast iron in the reamed holes in the bearings on the sole plate. I don't want this to be a press fit, I want it to be an easy fit so I can use Loctite 603. And by easy fit, I mean not tight, not a rattle fit. Anticipating someone removing these bearings at a future time, all they will have to do is heat up the cast iron blocks that support the bushes, and no violence will be required. Don't forget these support blocks for the main bearings are cast as part of the sole plate and as such are made from cast iron. Cast iron's very strong but it's not if you hit it with a hammer. I've turned the part around in the chuck again and what I'm doing is turning this part to the finished diameter and this needs to be the same diameter as the boss on the flywheel and it's going to be a lot better than two fibre washers. Now it's time for the centre hole. This has to be accurate. I centre drilled it first and then I went through with a drill which is one imperial size less than the whole diameter I finally require. After this I was ready for the reaming operation but I couldn't find my 930 seconds of an inch diameter reamer. So I went through with a 930 seconds of an inch twist drill. This is not good practice at all but if you don't have the tools you can't do the job. Here once again I've turned the part around in the chuck, I'm now holding it by the larger diameter. The work is being supported by a life centre in the hole. This keeps everything quite secure and quite accurate. This is the final cut and for this I'm using a small parting tool and I'm cutting towards the life centre. You may be interested to know that I didn't use a micrometer for this job. I kept removing the life centre and then I use the engine's bearings as a gauge. Don't forget, I did say right at the beginning, this is an experiment. After it was turned to the right size, I needed to part it off. This process gave me two bearing bushes, one for the flywheel end and one for the other end. I don't want anything binding with these bushes when I fit them into the sole plate, so I'm using a file to clean up the ends. Doing this job really didn't take long at all. I now have a pair of bearings and if my calculations are correct, everything should work out okay. In this clip I'm using a deburring tool. I want to make sure that this part fits perfectly level against the bearing block. Here you can see what type of fit it is. It's almost a piston fit. I was going to make the bearings longer, but I decided not to in the end. I felt that it would look like a repair if I did that. Now the time has come, using some Loctite 603, to fit my special bushes into the bearing blocks. I'm using a generous amount of this, I want to make sure that it's firmly stuck into the hole. Loctite 603 and paint don't mix very well. So after I'd fitted the bushes in place, I wiped off any excess Loctite 603 using a cloth. After fitting the first bush, I fitted the second one in exactly the same way. In this clip you can see where I filed the other side of the bearing blocks, because the original holes were not exactly in the middle of the shaped casting. Here's a very bad camera angle of the application of the Loctite 603, 
and when it finally comes back into focus, I just gently tap the bearing into place with a hammer. And then went down to the house and made a cup of tea. You watch in this sequence exactly as it happened. First of all, I lubricated the crankshaft, then I carefully pushed the crankshaft into the bushes, and they fitted very well indeed. I'm quite pleased with this, because as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, most of this job was done by feel. This part of the job is very important. I haven't forgotten to drill the holes in the top of the bushes to let the oil through from the oil cups. I know there are bits of cast iron all over the place, but for the moment it really doesn't matter. Before I put the engine together properly, I'm going to clean it up, paint it, degrease it and do whatever I need to do. I'm going to bed it in using my trusty DeWalt drill. And that looks pretty good to me. Have a look at the crank web. It seems to be running very accurately. I'm not doing this for long. I'll run in the engine properly once it's all back together. You can see the black oil that's run out, which is a sure sign of metal-to-metal -metal contact, as the hills and valleys in the metal at microscopic level are all flattened off somewhat. What I did next was to thoroughly clean the engine bed. I haven't done much with the cylinder, I'll do that later. I cleaned off the damaged paint around the bearing blocks and then I repainted the bare metal using some self-etched primer. Then I had a look through my stock of paint and look what I found, some Stuart Green paint. I've had this for ages because I normally use Great Western Railway Green and not this stuff. You can see how old it is by the address on the tin. It's from the time when Stuart models were based in Guernsey. The next part of the job is to wait 24 hours for the etch primer to cure. I will paint the top part of the engine using the Stuart Green and the bottom part of the engine with some gloss black. Then all I need to do is put it back together and see if it works and find out if my experiment has been a success or a failure. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.